Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode it could be taking you guys back to the year in 2008 to look at Liam Neeson's action thriller Taken. So let's go back to Paris, let's take that telephone call, let's play you guys a trailer and I'll see you soon. Hi daddy. You were supposed to call me when you left. Someone here. What? Oh my god, they got Amanda. They got me. All right, listen to me. Go to the next bedroom, under the bed. Tell me when you're there. <laughs> now, the next part is very important. They're going to take you. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. Where are they? If you let my daughter go now, that'll be the end of it. You have a 96 hour to what? To never finding her. No. But if you don't, I will look for you. Where is she? I will find you. And I will kill you. Good luck. And welcome back guys, so the synopsis for this film is a retired CIA agent travels across Europe and relies on his old skills to save his estranged daughter, who has been kidnapped while on a trip to Paris. It's a PG-13, it's got a 90 minute runtime, and it's a action thriller. It was directed by French director Pierre Morel and he is known for a movie called District 13 which he directed before this movie and he would later go on to direct From Paris With Love, starring John Travolta, which is another action movie uh, in Paris, obviously, and it's quite a good movie. I think it's quite an underrated movie. It might be one f- another movie for bite-sized cinema in the future. And it's written by Luc Besson. I'm a big fan of Luc Besson. He is a writer, he's a director. He wrote um, the cult classic Leon with Jean Reno, who plays the assassin. Uh, the Transporter starring Jason Statham. I think that pretty much helped his career out. Um, Bruce Willis's Fifth Element. That's a great sci-fi movie. And the cult classic assassin movie Nikita. So he has got a catalogue of movies. He is a bit of a legend in the world of cinema, Mr. Luke Besson. And Luke Besson and Pierre Morel came up with this idea whilst having some dinner. So whilst they were out having a bit of lobster and chardonnay, they were talking to each other. They are probably saying, should we make a movie? Yeah, okay, what do you want to make? Let's make a movie about a CIA agent whose daughter gets um, kidnapped and he has to go and rescue. He's gone, yeah, fine, let's do it. So then they've gone to 20th Century Fox and Europa Corp. So it's two distributors who have amal- amalgamated. So you've basically got a... Hollywood distributor and a European distributor. They said, fine, make the movie. Here's $25 million, go and make this film. And I think $25 million is is a lot of money. It's a lot of money to me, but I think it's fairly low budget for the, the, other, the other movies that were being made around about this time. They then spoke about who they wanted to have as the lead um, character in this movie, as an actor. And they initially went to go and speak to Jeff Bridges about being casting him as the lead role. But Jeff Bridges turned it down. He said it wasn't really something for him. So then they would go and speak to Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson accepted it. But at the time, he thought that this would just be a low budget, straight to DVD um, action movie. Because there was an awful lot of action movies about. A lot of them, you know, gone straight to DVD. And Liam Neeson, honestly took on this uh, role A forgot because he wanted to go to France to um, learn a bit of karate ironically for a few weeks whilst he was um, starring in the film and he also thought that this film wouldn't necessarily do any harm to his career but he just thought that it'd just be something that he'll do you know a little bit of fun bit of an action movie and again like I said just a straight to DVD 
movie and he was fine with that and that was his expectation. And it's also worth mentioning leading up to taking for Liam Neeson as a actor, you know, he's had an incredible career. He started off in Anthony Hopkins' The Bounty in 1984, Patrick Swayze's Next to Kin, um, the Oscar winning Schindler's, Schindler's List, you know, he's done a variety of acting, he's an incredibly good actor. Um, he did Star Wars A New Hope, so he's done a bit of action there. He played um, the the bad guy, the antagonist in Batman Begins. Um, and he played Rob Roy, and he's also been in a, um, I guess you could say, a superhero movie where he did, you know, did an awful lot of action, but it kind of goes past, which is the, I guess you could say, the sort of underrated Dark Man movie which he was in. But he never seemed to get st- recognition or status as a action hero as such like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, or Van Damme or Bruce Willis to say until obviously he did this movie so he's turned up he's done his karate lessons in France he's filming this movie he thinks it's going to go to DVD it gets released and then boom it just goes through the roof it blows all the chart records it makes 220 million dollars worldwide it exceeded all expectations and overnight Liam Neeson has become an action hero, which everybody loves. And I must admit, when I watched this back in um, 2008 or 2009, I watched it on DVD. I actually rented it. I mean, we used to have rental stores, funny enough, it wasn't that long ago. And I had low expectations. I didn't think it was going to be as good as it is. And boy, I got to the end of this movie, and it's very rare that I actually want to uh, re-watch it straight away. And actually, I did. I re- re-watched it. I loved it. And it's, um, you know, it's got a short running time and it just does everything that you want it to do. And I will just explain why I think this film is successful in the way it is. And it's a theory that I've always had. It goes right back to Die Hard. I know this is the massive segue. But when you look at the Die Hard movie that came out in 1988, you've just got a normal guy playing the action hero. You've got John McClane, he's an everyday guy. Um, and it's just become a successful action movie and people got behind that character because he's a relatable character, he's an everyday guy and I think you get that with this movie as well Um, Brian Mills' character, when you watch this film he's unassuming, he's not not a muscle-bound, ripped character he's not arrogant, he's a relatable character he's got an ex-wife, he hasn't got any money he lives in a normal house like everybody else. And he's worrying about buying a present for his daughter. And this is the thing. This is the thing right at the beginning of the movie. He's worrying about what karaoke machine he's going to buy his daughter. And then when he does turn up at the birthday party, again, he's kind of, you know, hello, hello, sweetheart, how are you? At no point do you know how much of a badass this character is. And that is what I think makes this film work is because... His daughter gets kidnapped. It's kind of relatable. And then all of a sudden, you've got Liam Neeson that turns into a proper badass. But it's like a... He becomes like a plausible one at the same time. He's he's relatable. He's not like fantasy or anything like that. You you do come away from the end of this film thinking... This could actually be plausible. The the skills and training that he's got from the CIA. He's uh, jiu-jitsu. He's trained himself enough. He He could deal with that. And um, that's what I like about this film. You sort of come away and you think this this is a, it's plausible. Um, and again, the most important thing here, and I think this is what reaches out to everybody watching this film, you know, from an audience perspective, is that it is relatable. I've used that word before, well, just a minute ago, but um, we all have loved ones, you know, we're all parents. I'm talking about fathers, I'm talking about mothers. Um, it's what you would do for your, you know, your next to kin, your little one. If someone was to kidnap them, you go above and beyond. And I think that's why we all get behind Brian Mills in this film, because you're rooting for him. And because he's got these skills and these talents and he takes on these bad guys, you are right behind him and you're thinking, come on, Brian, you want to get your daughter back? And that's what I do every time I watch this film, because I do have a daughter myself and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, what you what you would do for you. You know, your next kid and stuff like that. So that's that's why I think this film works. And I think that's why it's got the edge um, to it from other action movies um, that are kicking around, you know, around about this time. So I think that's why it's successful. And 
another film um, whilst I'm on the subject is John Wick you know it did the same thing for me at the beginning uh, John Wick he's you know he's got his house he's lost his wife um, you know he's got a dog and he lives by himself and again at the beginning of that movie it's like an unassuming character you know he's just minding his own business and then all of a sudden you know he gets burgled he gets taken on by the mob and then bang you know this guy becomes an assassin you think whoa you know what's happened there and you, you know you're right behind this character and it, again John Wick has become a successful franchise and I think it's because of that reason because you know John Wick is just an everyday guy who you root behind to take on the bad guys but the one thing I have noticed with both of these films kind of segue into John Wick and Taken is that you know they, they've got sequels the other thing I was going to mention you know um, Taken spawned you know two sequels and a TV show become very successful John Wick's kind of going down the same route but as they've moved on as a franchise they've kind of come away from what I've just said there they have become these um, larger than life action hero characters from when you had them in the first film where they were just like normal day everyday guys so the, <laughs> the films have gone into that sort of Hollywood fight you know over the top action particularly with John Wick his, his kill count with every movie is going up and up and up which is fine you know because they're entertaining don't get me wrong but all I'd say is that I really preferred those first two, you know, the first movies where, you know, you had them in their house, unassuming characters and got taken on by the mob and then they were going, you know, you go and kick butt. So um, hopefully that kind of explains my take on, on, on this film, you know, to how, why I think it's successful and I think it's just that formula right there. So there you go, let's move on, mate. Let's talk about the... Um, Let's talk about who else is in this film, from uh, apart from Liam Neeson. So the film also stars uh, Maggie Grace as Kim, who plays uh, Brian Mills' daughter. Uh, Leyland also as Sam. Uh, you've got a cameo role from Holly Valance, the singer. She plays Shearer. Uh, Katie Cassidy as Amanda. Xander Berkeley as Stuart. Fame Jensen, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She plays Lenore. And that is some of the cast, just to name just a few. And a little bit of trivia, because you all know how much I love my trivia in these films. So you've got different titles for this film. It's uh, around the world, it's called 96 Hours. I think that might have been the Japan title, Hostage in Germany. And I Will Find You, which um, is in another part of the world. So it had some different titles. And it's got a total kill rate of 35. And Liam Neeson was actually trained because he'd already gone out to France to train in karate. But he was also trained by the SAS for combat weapons and skills. And he actually performed many of his own stunts in this film with a combination of jiu-jitsu and judo and karate. So kind of like a sort of mixed martial arts, which is pretty cool. So there you go guys, there's a trivia, there's a production, that's how this film got put together, that's the greatness of it and the reason why I love this film. So let's do a bite-sized review of Taken. So the film starts off with Brian Mills, played by Liam Neeson, and he is a retired CIA agent who is trying to build a relationship with his 17-year-old daughter, who lives with his ex-wife and her now new um, wealthy husband. As, as I mentioned earlier on in the show, Brian Mills' his character is very unassuming. At this point, you wouldn't know that he was a badass. He was just an everyday bloke. And then he gets offered a job with security for a um, pop concert to look after a singer, Shira, which is played by Holly Valance. And this job is offer, offered to him by his ex-CIA buddies, who ha also have a particular set of skills, which you find out later on. And at the concert, um, whilst it's scorched in Shearer from a overcrowded concert, this is where you find out that he has these uh, particular skills because he takes on a guy with a knife and he takes him down pretty good with some, uh, I think it's like some jujitsu skills. And as a thank you for saving her life, Shearer offers uh, Brian some singing lessons to his daughter. But before Brian can tell his daughter about this, um, his ex-wife asked him for permission for the, his daughter Kim to go on a tour around Europe, which he is unha unhappy about because he knows all what goes on in the world and the 
and the safety issues for a 17 year old to be traveling by herself. He tries to warn Kim and eventually he gives permission for this but whilst at the airport whilst Kim is about to go off with her friend he finds out that they are actually going on a tour with a rock band which is U2. Kim and her friend arrive in France and then they meet up with an attractive young Frenchman called Peter who offers to share a taxi. And then later that afternoon they get to the apartment and they're having a lot of fun. Kim's friend answers the door and they get abducted by some Albanian men. But before Kim gets uh, abducted she phones up her father, she speaks to Brian and he tells her that she's going to be kidnapped and this is where he comes out with that iconic line and he says to the Albanian on the other end of the phone he says I have a particular set of skills, skills that make me a nightmare for you I will find you, I will hunt you down and I will kill you so there's that iconic line but a little bit of trivia here this is just a little bit of a segue Brian Mills didn't actually wasn't the first one to actually say this this was actually first used in a John Carpenter film going back to 1998 and that is uh, James Woods' Jack Vampires where he tells his friend Montana who's been bitten by a vampire he actually comes out with his words at the end of the movie he says look I'm going to give you two weeks but after that two weeks I will hunt you down I will find you and I will kill you so there you go it's actually said by that badass uh, Jack Crow so but I'm not going to take anything away from the Brian Mills characters he does it great it's iconic it's brilliant and it works really well for this movie but I just thought I'd segue into a little bit of John Carpenter trivia because I've mentioned JC for a little while now on the show but going back to Paris with time running out with the Albanians kidnapping Brian Mills' daughter he now goes to uh, his ex-wife's husband he's got an awful lot of money and he says right I told you about this guys you wouldn't listen to me so I need a flight to Paris yesterday and he gets himself out there he goes to the airport and his first port call is the actual apartment where they got kidnapped and he finds a damaged mobile phone and he goes through all the images and he finds a picture of Peter, that good looking Frenchman, that creepy French dude who um, was behind getting his daughter kidnapped. So he pays a visit to the airport, he finds Peter and he's like, hello Peter, how are you doing? Chucks him in the back of a taxi and it's a great scene. He gets this slimy dude, gives him a good old salt out of the airport. Peter runs away, you get a chase scene, you get Brian Mills in the car, you can see he can drive that car pretty well. And Peter gets splattered by a truck before he can get any information out of him. And whilst all this is happening, I forgot to mention this, uh, Brian's CIA buddy is making all the inquiries about this Albanian gang and he says that you've only got 96 hours to find a daughter or else, you know, you she's just going to disappear. So the clock is now ticking. Brian then seeks the help of a French intelligence agent, Jean-Claude, who informs him that there is a red light district brothel and he believes that the Albanians are operating from there, so it gives him some intelligence. But then he says to him, don't get involved. Um, but Brian basically tells him to go to hell and he goes to visit this brothel and he finds some young girls. They've been um, overdosed with drugs and they've been turned into prostitutes. He tries to rescue some of the girls, but upon this he gets attacked by an Albanian gang and you get a gunfight scene, you get another really good action scene, you get some shooting, you get some fighting, you get a good car chase. Uh, Brian manages to rescue one of the girls who's actually wearing a denim jacket of one of Kim's friends. And then the next morning after they escaped, this girl tells him that um, Kim and her friend were taken to a safe house by the Albanian gang. So... Brian poses as uh, his uh, friend Jean-Claude and he enters the house under the pretense and he starts negotiating with the gang and he's trying to find out who Marco is and everybody starts saying I'm Marco, I'm Marco. So he tries to get a bit clever and he's put himself in a real situation here. he's outnumbered by about 10 to 1. He picks up some sugar and he says, how do you say sugar? And they say sugar, like that. And then he says, can you... Um, pronounce this name for me as well and he sort of gives him a bit of paper and he says gives it to one of the guys and he says good luck and then that's how he puts the two together with that telephone call and this is where Brian finds out that he's just found Marco and he says to him I told you I'd find you 
I was on the phone with you and I told you I had a particular set of skills and I will find you and I will kill you. Marco pulls out a gun. It's where Brian takes it off him. He starts shooting up all the other gang members. He has a really good fight. Puts in his jiu-jitsu skills. You get a really good fight scene here. And after this fight sequence, he captures Marco alive. He has a quick search of this house and he finds Kim's friend dead on a bed. She's all drugged up. Uh, she's died of an overdose. So then he takes Marco into a room, puts him onto a chair and he starts questioning him. He says, what have you done with my daughter? Marco's not saying anything, so he says, fine. And this is where he interrogates him with some electricity, puts some spikes through his, through his um, thighs. And he starts saying, electricity is not too good around here. Apparently it doesn't trip. And then he leaves it running. Marco then tells him about Patrice St. Clair, who is an abaya for um, young girls. Uh, for a prostitution ring and he also finds out his uh, best friend Jean-Claude is part of this racket as well so um, he leaves the ru electricity running he kills Marco he gets his comeuppance and then he goes and visits his friend Jean-Claude at his apartment and this is where he inv exposes Jean-Claude's um, nasty little game to his wife and in order to get the information from him about the whereabouts of his daughter he shoots his wife through her um, shoulder and gets the information he needs from Jean-Claude before knocking him out. Brian then infiltrates a sex slave auction taking place at St. Clair's Manor where uh, Kim is subject to being um, auctioned off but um, Brian manages to get into one of the booths and he tells one of the buyers to start bidding for his daughter he wins the bid, but as he leaves the booth, he gets captured uh, by several henchmen. He gets tied up to a pipe and he starts to get interrogated. And through this interrogation, Brian manages to release himself from the pipe. He takes on the henchman and he ultimately takes on St. Clair by killing him. But before he kills him, he gets St. Clair to reveal the whereabouts of his daughter. And she has been taken to a yacht by one of his clients called Raymond. Brian then goes to the right, he infiltrates it, he starts eliminating all the bodyguards and like I say, this film is just like non-stop action for the third part of the movie. He really does go and kick their butt. And then he manages to find Raymond, he's got um, his daughter in a seat, sweet, with um, a knife to her neck and then Brian, he takes him out, he takes a headshot to him. He kills all the bad guys and then he manages to rescue his daughter. And then this is where you get the close of the movie where he returns his daughter back to his um, ex-wife and her husband. He saves the day and then the film ends with uh, Brian taking Kim to a singing lesson with Shira who's played by Holly Philance and then that's how the film wraps up. It really is a short action movie. Like I say, it gets to point A to B very quickly. It's entertaining. You're backing Brian all the way to go and rescue his daughter. And like I say, it's just a fun movie. It's just a fun all-round movie, which did incredibly well back in 2008. But my only criticism of the ending of this film is the part where you've got the singing lesson with Holly Valance. I kind of see where they're going. They want to they want to have a happy ending. But I I think that Kim would be suffering some, you know, you know post-traumatic syndrome here after the war she'd been through. And I don't think singing lessons would be on her mind. So... If they just had that at the end of the movie with her sort of crying in the shoulder of Liam Neeson, I think that probably would have been a better ending for me. That would have been more realistic. I, I think this would actually take a long time for her to overcome. So uh, I think that's just where Hollywood step in and try and make it like a happy ending. But um, there you go. That's my only criticism of this film. Apart from that, it's a good, really good, solid movie. And as I say, guys, if if you have seen it, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it like I have. Um, hopefully it's entertained you. I'm sure it has. I don't know anybody that doesn't really like this film. And um, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Like I say, it's a fun movie. Uh, like I say, it gets you from point A to B very quickly. It's just an incredibly entertaining movie. So there you go. That is taken from 2008. So I hope you enjoyed that um, bite-sized review. Um, I will be back soon for quite a few episodes actually i'm quite busy at the moment i've just uh, released well recorded and released a uh, guest episode with dan bone from the podcast on haunted hill we just done masters of the universe and we had a lot of fun with that so that's um, available to listen to 
And at the end of that shot, I said to Dan, um, you know, I'm looking at Dorian Enter the Dragon. He said, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing that. So he's he's coming back to uh, guest for Enter the Dragon. So I'm looking forward to talking to him about that. And I've also got another guest coming onto the show. We've got Mark Lockhart. I've spoken to him on another show that I did called Dude Looks Like the 80s. And we're going to be talking about uh, Beverly Hills Cop from 1984. So I'm looking forward to that. And I've got a couple of other shows in line. I've also got Leonardo DiCaprio's The Beach as a solo show. And in the works, I'm thinking about doing a James Bond film. So I was thinking, what James Bond film do I do? Because there's so many to choose from. So I've decided to go right in the middle. Uh, One of my favourite Bonds, which is uh, Roger Moore. And I really like the one where he took on Scaramanga, that's it. It's where James Bond versus Count Dracula, it's the man with the golden gun. So I'm going to be taking a look at that, so that will be dropping sometime soon, so look out for that. And as some admin guys, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows there. And if you want to listen to the show, there's other places you can listen to it. There's uh, YouTube, there's iTunes... And if you put Bite Size Cinema Podcast Legion into Google, it will give you some choices for some other players to listen to the show. Um, So there you go, guys. That's it. Um, I'll close the show. Keep it bite size. Keep it fun. And I will see you soon. this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell mean power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero ghost show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark mental health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, the podcast by the cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.